this session, we are going to focus on the lessons from the 1910 Manchurian plague in the prevention of a communicable disease. And then next, we have uh, um, Professor Stephen Baker, uh, professor from Institute of Therapeutic Immunology and Infectious Disease, University of Cambridge, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, Dr. Stephen Baker is a director of research based in the Department of Medicine at the University of Cambridge and an ordinary professor at the University of Oxford. His research focuses on studying the mechanisms and epidemiological influences of uh, antimicrobial resistant gram-negative bacteria. His research group explores various genomic and the laboratory techniques to understand how antimicrobial and resistance bacteria emerge, spread, and how best they can be uh, combated. He has published more than 400 scientific articles and is a recognized name in global health, uh, health with a portfolio of work ranging from typhoid fever and other enteric diseases to hospital acquired infections and zoonosis. And so uh, Dr. Baker, please. Uh, hello, good uh, Good morning from the UK. So, so thank you for inviting me to speak at this uh, uh, great meeting. It's a pleasure to represent uh, Cambridge University um, and also to, to talk about some of the work that follows on really from uh, the historic work that was done back at the beginning of, of the 20th century with respect to the Mancurian Plague. So uh, I'm a bacteriologist. Um, my focus is on uh, drug-resistant bacteria mainly and how we understand them and also then how we, how we tackle them. Um, but as we all know, we've been um, challenged by what's happened in the world over the last two years with the emergence of this new pathogen. And I think it, it lends lessons to what happened some time ago. So obviously a different organism, a bacteria, a hundred years ago, where now we're talking about these viruses that emerge and circulate from animal populations and cause these devastating pandemics. So this is where I work. I work in a, the Jeffrey Shea Biomedical Center, so um, named after uh, the famous uh, Malaysian businessman Jeffrey Shea, who sponsors our building. Uh, and we run a, a BSL-2 and a BSL-3 facility, understanding a range of different infectious diseases. Uh, but my experience stems really from spending a lot of time working overseas, particularly in Asia. And I was lucky enough to spend over a decade working in Vietnam, uh, studying emerging infections and then developing an interest really in the emergence of new novel drug resistant bacteria. And now in Cambridge to understand how uh, we can tackle them. So we're faced with many global health challenges has been proven recently. And I think we're better prepared now than we ever were before for these as they emerge with new vaccine technology, genomic sequencing, uh, new therapeutics. Um, but actually, we're still not very good at predicting how they emerge and what we do uh, to stop them. Uh, lots of things, uh, most emerging infectious diseases actually originate from low middle income countries, particularly uh, in and around uh, South and Southeast Asia. Uh, and this is a, a mechanism really of understanding how we then control our environment and what we do to prevent these things emerging and spreading and causing devastating uh, problems. And the problem that we're really trying to tackle at the moment is understanding how drug resistant bacteria work and what we can do about them. So whilst doing this then and setting up a laboratory in Cambridge, we were faced with this emerging threat. Um, I arrived back on an airplane in the beginning of March, 2020 from Southeast Asia and was faced by uh, a country that was uh, on the edge of really not really knowing what to do. So it seems pretty kind of um, naive at the moment, really considering everything that's happened in the last two years. But the first thing we did was, was turn our uh, facility into a, uh, a, a diagnostics and genomics facility within a few weeks. Uh, we set up uh, swabbing for, for um, staff in the hospital and we were the first group in the world to generate data on asymptomatic carriage, particularly in healthcare workers, and start to understand the process of how the organism was not only causing asymptomatic disease in the community, but also how that was, at, was being stimulated and causing transmission within the hospital. So from our screening work of screening people working in the hospital, we were able to identify hospital outbreaks. So here on the left-hand side, uh, different wards at the bottom, green wards were clean ones, presumed to be no COVID, and red ones were wards with COVID patients in. And this is all from screening data that was done in um, 
uh, March and April 2020. So we can clearly see the number of peaks there associated with the number of positives in the red area showing that we were getting quite a lot of active transmission between people on the wards and particularly people working at the hospital. And on the left hand side, even in clean wards, we still had a number of people that were testing positive and causing these sporadic outbreaks on the wards that were being circulated by healthcare workers. So this was really helped us then understand how to control it within the hospital to limit circulation of the virus. Uh, to put better infection control measures in place, but also allowed us to limit the people that were coming and attending work that may be infected, but also allowing us to release the people uh, that were being tested, that were actually testing negative and could come back to work. And that really kept the hospital open and allowed us to have the lowest transmission rate of SARS-CoV-2, uh, hospital SARS-CoV-2 in the UK at the time. And following on from this then, we were also then allowed to plug into an ongoing network called COG UK. So this was a genomics network allowing sequencing. So from our PCR testing, we were then extracting, uh, providing the nucleic acid to our genomics facility. And it allowed us then to start understanding transmission by creating these fairly complex phylogenetic trees, both looking at national chains, looking at how the virus was emerging and evolving within the UK, how it was being introduced, but also here on the right hand side, more kind of sensitive detection of looking at the emergence and spread of virus on particular wards within the hospital to understand the transmission rate, to understand the frequency, and to also understand the patients that were at risk from particular uh, outbreaks, such as in this case, up on the right-hand side, we found a particular uh, outbreak in, in dialysis patients, which is associated with them traveling to an outpatient clinic. Okay, but then <clears throat> moving on from this, so how does then this link in to, to the work that's been described earlier? So as I said earlier, I'm not a virologist, I'm a bacteriologist. Um, but we know quite a lot more about how the virus works and we understand then how it's transmitted, particularly through air. And we know that the, the use of uh, specific types of masks uh, prevents the, both the transmission uh, from the people exhaling it, but also prevents uh, people that may be uninfected from inhaling it as it's circulating in the air because the, the, the virus is transmitted in small aerosolizable droplets. So when we breathe or sneeze or speak, then we produce these small uh, droplets containing uh, these particular viral particles. So we have guidelines for um, the way um, we have guidelines for the way we operate uh, our air, uh, our, um, our water, and our food and our environment. But we have no um, guidelines for the cleanliness of air and the and the pathogens that are circulating in air. So uh, SAGE, uh, this is the, the group uh, uh, that provides advice to the government on how to handle such pandemics, identified this as an issue and then understanding how we can improve air quality and wards uh, in hospitals. And actually then this led us to looking at how we can use air filtration devices as a mechanism reducing transmission and circulation of the virus on wards. Um, and then this then is associated with how we then set up these studies, some advice. So clearly then the guidance here of understanding how we can see whether we can remove SARS-CoV-2 from other pathogens from the air uh, using such air filtration devices. So we set up a study. So we borrowed these NIOSH air samplers from a CDC Atlanta. These are air sampling things that we put on um, um, drip stands and they allow two, partic two particulates, so there's a vacuum pump which sample the air uh, and then a small tube which gets small particles and then a larger tube which gets the, the, the larger droplets. We did two test rooms, so this is two different wards, one a, 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 an overflow ward uh, containing SARS-CoV-2 patients and another ICU ward and we put in two large portable air filtration devices in these rooms and then we tested them in a crossover trial effect whereby we had them switched off for a week, had them switched on for a week and had them, uh, had them switched off again. And then we performed air filtration, uh, air, air sampling on a daily basis. And we have some nice technology now. So not only then could we then use this as a mechanism to extract nucleic acid from these air samples, but also then we have a machine which allows us to detect 96 different path respiratory pathogens in one go. Um, so we extracted uh, the, the samples from the air and then ran them on our machine. It's a really nice kind of microfluidic system, uh, which means we work in small volumes and it means we can multiplex multiple samples at the same time to identify what's going on. So this is some data. Um, so on week one here with the machines turned off, so the different, the, 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 the stars correspond with the, um, the ward and the circle correspond with the ICU. 
uh, we can see then here on ward um, on week one, we can detect SARS-CoV-2 in the air. On week two, when the machine uh, was switched on in both wards, we only have one detection on day nine. And then on day three, uh, on week three again, we can see the return of the virus into the air. So not only this then, but with multiple other pathogens uh, here, so a number of different fungal bacterial that are not typically associated with airborne transmission and also other viruses. Here we can see then stratified by on the, on the left uh, when the air filtration device, the HEPA air filtration device is off and then when it's on, we can see a marked reduction as highlighted by the bar chart in the middle on both the ICU on the right hand side and also the ward on the left hand side that we can actually almost completely obliterate circulation of multiple different airborne pathogens by the use of simple air filtration devices uh, that are available from commercial outlets with HEPA filtration and UV filters. So just to then conclude this kind of short talk leading in from where we've got to with the pandemic and are thinking about how we then control these things in the future and about what we do. Uh, I think that as highlighted earlier, the, the, the invention and the utilization uh, of masks uh, during the Mancurian plague epidemic really then helped us to understand and pre to, to prevent how these airborne pathogens can be stopped by simple interventions. And actually the fact that we're still using these today and they're very good at preventing circulation of SARS-CoV-2 is important, but also protecting our other environment from SARS-CoV-2 and other pathogens, particularly hospital environments and air filtration devices uh, with HEPA filtration and UV are clearly then a mechanism that can be produced into public areas to not only reduce the circulation of SARS-CoV-2, but other potential uh, infectious agents in hospitals to reduce uh, disease transmission. So thank you very much for your attention uh, and uh, thank you again for inviting me to speak.